So hello, everyone, all the listeners out there. We're really glad to have you as part of our webinar today. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor at Hordes Dairyman. I want to thank you for joining us. Hordes Dairyman and the University of Illinois have been co-hosting these presentations since 2011. Our team consists of Jim Baltz from the University of Illinois and Patty Hurchin from Hordes Dairyman, our online media manager, and they do the work behind the scenes to make sure everything runs smoothly for these webinars each month. I am fortunate to have Mike Hutchins, who is also from the University of Illinois, as my co-host today. Together, we have the pleasure of welcoming Ev Thomas from Oak Point Agronomics as our presenter. If you're a reader of Horde Steriman, Ev's name might sound familiar to you, as he is a regular columnist for us, one of the authors of our Feed to Feed Bunk article, which appears in the magazine. We're fortunate to have him with us today as a presenter, and he will be speaking to us more on reduced lignin alfalfa and other alfalfa variety considerations. Um, definitely a hot topic in the industry. We look forward to hearing Ev's thoughts on this. The webinar is sponsored by Harv Extra, and we are very pleased to have their support of this program. If you're listening to the presentation live and you would like a copy of the handouts, look over to the GoToWebinar panel, which should be on your computer screen. If you look down a few sections, there is an area that says Handouts, and in that spot, you can download PDFs of the presentation slides. That is a special bonus for the people that are listening to the webinar live today. Mike, I think at this point we're ready. If you could go ahead and introduce Ev a little more thoroughly and then kickstart the webinar, that would be great. Well, very good. Thanks very much, Abby. And uh, actually, it is my personal and professional honor to introduce Ev Thomas to you. And remember, his formal name is Everett, but everybody calls him Ev Thomas. And uh, Abby, he is a repeat uh, presenter here under popular demand. So, Ev, we are welcome. We'd love to have you back here. Uh, Ev uh, received his bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut in Animal Sciences and his master's uh, in extension education from Cornell in 1967. I assume you started at college college when you're three years of age. But he has been agronomist in north, uh, northern New York for 52 years, first at Cornell and then joined the group at the William H. Minard Agricultural Institute in Chasey, New York. And now he is currently a president of uh, Oak Point Agronomics. As you heard from Abby, he's uh, been very active writing. He's had 140 articles published in Horge Dairyman and authored over 600 technical and popular press articles. So we're very excited to have Ab Thomas back with with us here and uh, with the title, The Lowdown on Reduced Lignin Alfalfa. Ev, uh, take it away. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here. Uh, sure, let's talk about reduced lignin alfalfa and uh, toward the end of the presentation, I'm making some comments on some other alfalfa variety uh, uh, possibilities. The improvements in, in alfalfa yield, uh, especially, and quality, have been really slow in coming for many years. And, and until not too long ago, most of the big genetic improvements were in disease resistance. And now we have varieties that are resistant to five or more diseases. So some of the main ones would be anthracnose, verticillium wilt, and phytophthora. But the problem with this is, even though there's usually not any additional cost for uh, adding a disease resistance, unless a disease is present, uh, we don't see a big impact on performance, either on yield or in quality. For example, verticillium wilt has been considered the old age disease of alfalfa, yet in many cases, farmers' modern rotation plans uh, wind up uh, plowing alfalfa down before verticillium has had a chance to be a significant problem. So certainly it's nice to have these, uh, these varieties that are high in disease resistance, uh, but they have not contributed greatly uh, to, to alfalfa yield. But as we get into the, the new era uh, with reduced lignin alfalfa, or you might want to call it high digestibility alfalfa if you want to talk about the, the glass being half full versus half empty, uh, this is going to be a real game changer. Uh, I think it's the most significant improvement in alfalfa forage quality in many years. We have varieties that are genetically engineered, and we also have those that are conventionally bred. Prior to this, many of the improvements in quality were achieved by more intensive harvest management. 
but that was self-limiting because once we start harvesting before the bud stage, there's such an impact on, on yield and also on stand longevity that in a lot of cases, farmers feel that they have pushed intensive harvest man management just as, about as far as they can go. But as we look at reduced lignin alfalfa, planting these varieties may well result in improved forage quality, and we may actually increase both yield and stand longevity depending on our harvest timing. In other words, when we go and get these varieties, and I'll be talking more about that in, the, in a few minutes. Now, hard extra alfalfa varieties are genetically modified, and they include both the Roundup Ready trait and the trait that results in significantly reduced lignin content. We also have conventionally bred alfalfa varieties, and they're also being promoted as having reduced lignin uh, and or higher digestibility, and they're also available. We have high gest alfalfa, uh, and these have these varieties have lower lignin and higher digestibility. And there's also a variety of Kingfisher 425 HD that in trials has been looking to have uh, higher than normal digestibility. Now, the Kingfisher has a normal lignin content. In other words, the increased digestibility has been achieved by, uh, by other methods. It was bred for higher fiber digestibility whereas the Harv Extra and the Hygest were bred for lower lignin. Now, if you look at the little table here, in university trials, comparing these reduced lignin varieties to the Czech varieties, in other words, conventional alfalfa varieties, you can see that Harv Extra has about twice as much decrease in lignin as increase in, in fiber digestibility. In other words, 14% lower lignin and 7% higher NDF digestibility. The high-gest variety, on the other hand, has about the same decrease in lignin as the, does the increase in fiber digestibility. In both cases, about 5%. And so you can see there, there are differences depending on whether you look at the genetically enhanced or genetically modified varieties or those that were developed using conventional plant breeding. Now, I want to emphasize that, that, that this, uh, this table does not represent research. But what this is, is this is the results of the 2017 World, World Forage Analysis Super Bowl, where farmers entered what they considered uh, to be their, their best alfalfa. And they broke this into three categories, the conventional alfalfa, in other words, varieties that were not specifically bred for higher digestibility. And then we would call the conventional high quality varieties, in other words, not genetically engineered. This would include the high gest and, and perhaps the kingfisher and perhaps a couple of other varieties that are being promoted as high quality. And then the third one would be the Harv Extra. And you can see by the number of entries, there's not a lot of entries with Harv Extra, and that's because it is very new technology. But even though we have a limited number of entries, I think what we are seeing in, in so far in the Super Bowl numbers are pretty close to what we may see as we get more and more samples in. If you look at crude protein, you'll see that the conventional high quality varieties uh, are a percent or so higher in crude protein than the conventional varieties, in other words, the non-reduced lignin varieties, as, whereas the Harv Extra uh, picks up about three more points. Looking at NDF, at neutral detergent fiber, the conventional alfalfa is about 37%. The high quality varieties drop that by, oh, perhaps three and a half percent. And the Harv Extra drops it by another few percent. As we get into what farmers consider, a lot of cases consider the more important numbers, 30 hour fiber digestibility, about 47% with conventional alfalfa, 49% with the conventional high quality varieties and almost 53% with Harv Extra. So again, you can see that we are stepping up in the digestibility. As far as the relative forage quality, about a 30 point difference between the conventional and the conventional high quality varieties. So these are really making a difference in forage quality. And Harv Extra adding another over 30 points, 35 points or so. And the final one, milk per ton, which in a lot of cases is where farmers think the rubber meets the road. Uh, about 2,900 pounds of milk per ton with a conventional, 3,100 with a conventional high quality, and up to 3,300 with Harv Extra. Now, I need to emphasize again, this is not a research trial. It's not replicated, but I think it gives you an idea 
of, of what we are seeing and what I think as time goes along, what we're going to be seeing in the future. So let's talk about the harvest options with reduced lignin alfalfa because I think this is going to be quite important because we do have options in terms of when we can harvest reduced lignin alfalfa varieties more so than with conventional. The first option would be to harvest at the bud stage, which is what a lot of farmers are doing anyway. And this will result in very high crude protein and very high fiber digestibility. In some cases, perhaps higher than farmers have been used to in the past. The other thing this does is that if either weather or equipment problems or other things that go bump in the night prevent harvest at the bud stage, by planting a reduced lignin alfalfa variety, you will have anywhere from a few days to perhaps as much as 10 days, depending on which variety you plant, to harvest this alfalfa and still have it be good quality. By good, I, I would mean the same quality that you would expect in harvesting a conventional alfalfa variety at the bud stage. So it does give you a little longer harvest window when things happen that you don't intend on happening because the forage quality is gonna remain high for several days or more after the bud stage. And so that's, that's the first option that, that farmers have is harvesting at the time of year that they normally do because these reduced lignin alfalfa varieties are not appreciably early or later in their stage of bloom. Um, what they are is at any stage, they have significantly lower levels of lignin. That is the, that is the advantage. The other, the other harvest management system that's being recommended would be to delay harvest somewhere from seven to 10 days, probably closer to 10 days for the Harv Extra varieties, uh, less than that for the non-genetically uh, engineered varieties. And, and so you del delay harvest to perhaps 10% bloom. And by delaying harvest, you may wind up, in a lot of cases, probably will wind up with one or more more fewer cuttings per season. You will have higher root carbohydrates because nowadays as we're harvesting normal alfalfa varieties at the bud stage, uh, this is substantially less than what the plant would really like as far as root carbohydrate depositions. In other words, we continually harvest at the bud stage, that plant never has the chance to fully replenish root carbohydrates. The the other advantage we would have of delayed harvest would be that we have a lower harvest cost because if we harvest four times rather than five or three times rather than four, well, obviously there's going to be less, uh, less labor and less cost. Uh, but the third one is one that I, I think in some cases is underestimated. And that's the amount of crown damage that we do from field traffic. Long ago, an agronomist from, uh, from Cornell University I did some work and he estimated that even with a three cut system, by the time a farmer has gone in and harvested and uh, alfalfa three times, he has at least theoretically run over every plant in that field at least once with something heavy. And I've dug a lot of alfalfa plants out of three and four year old fields. And it's amazing how much crown damage some of these plants have and, and continue to live. But live and live well may be different things. And especially as we get into third and fourth year, I think a, a result of one or fewer, one or more uh, less cuttings per season uh, may start, the advantages may start to accumulate and we may see considerably healthier stands in the last couple of years of stand life. Will it mean we can extend stand life by one year or more? Well, perhaps. We don't have a lot of data on that yet, but I don't think it would be an unreasonable conclusion. And the other thing we may look at is in, in, in addition to having fewer harvests, we might wind up with higher annual yield along with the less, the, the, the one fewer harvest. And, and that's not just a guess because there was some University of uh, Wisconsin data that over a four year period, and, and note that this wasn't a one year trial, this was over four years, they got 15 to 20% higher yield with three cuts than they did four cuts. Of course, this was a conventional alfalfa variety, so delaying harvest resulted in more of an impact on forage quality than most farmers would be happy with. 
But as we start to impose this type of management on reduced lignin alfalfa, uh, maybe we're going to get 15 or 20 percent higher yield with three versus four cuts while still maintaining high forage quality. And that certainly would be a win-win situation. Let's look at this uh, at the uh, back up impact of field traffic a little bit more. I mean, this heavy equipment does damage crowns and it opens them up to disease and desiccation. You get more trips, you get more crown damage. In a lot of cases, we will be looking at crown at the crown damage two different times, two different ways, both short term and long term. Especially if farmers go in more than three or four days. Um, after the, the alfalfa was taken off the field, either to apply fertilizer to spread manure or to spread manure, we're gonna be doing damage to the crown buds. And that's gonna be short-term damage. And in a lot of cases that will be limited to the following crop, but we can certainly see, see the, uh, the effects of this uh, as, we, as we look at the, the next growing crop. But what I'm more concerned about is the long-term damage uh, that accumulates as we do damage to the crowns, essentially cracking the crowns and damaging them and allowing disease to go in. And so I think we have short-term and long-term impacts on field traffic, but I am more concerned about the long-term ones. Now let's get this, you know, let's be honest about this. Harvesting at the bud stage does never allows the alfalfa to fully recover root carbohydrates. But this doesn't mean that delaying harvest by seven to 10 days, uh, while it's closer to ideal, it's, it's not ideal. In, in order to get full carbohydrate recovery, we would have to get close to full bloom. And, and even with reduced lignin alfalfa varieties, whether it's the hard extra variety or varieties, or whether it's the ones with conventional produced versus with conventional breeding, uh, we're not recommending that we can still get good quality by letting alfalfa go all the way to full bloom. Now, the recommendation is a maximum of perhaps 10% bloom. Um, but again, while this is closer to the ideal, I want you to understand that we still are in a situation where we are applying stresses to these alfalfa plants because even harvesting a 10% bloom, we're not at full carbohydrate uh, recovery, but it's a lot closer to the ideal, and that's important. And I think one of the real advantages with reduced lignin alfalfa is that we have flexibility. Now, some of the seed companies that are marketing the Harv Extra varieties seem to prefer the bud stage harvest to, uh, versus delaying until 10% bloom. And, and we can argue that one back and forth. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, I would prefer to, to delay harvest a little bit, uh, and perhaps allow a little bit better uh, root carbohydrate recovery, but there's more than one ways uh, to do this. And the other thing is that, that harvest timing can be can be varied from from cut to cut. And there, there's no reason why you can't take one cut in the bud stage and then delay another one until early bloom. And again, five percent bloom, ten percent bloom, you know, there's all sorts of options. And bud stage harvest is probably more logical for second cut alfalfa than for fourth or fifth fifth cut. Uh, most farmers that have been out there, there in the field know that it's a real challenge getting second cut alfalfa harvested early enough to have high, high stem quality. Those second cut stems seem to get lignified very quickly. And so we may go into a situation where we have a reduced lignin alfalfa variety and we harvest the first cut at the bud stage, the second cut at the bud stage, and then as we get into third, fourth, and fifth cut, where quality very often is, is better anyway, oh, we may decide to delay uh, harvest there until anywhere from early bloom, you know, 5% to 10% bloom. So just because we take one cut at the bud stage doesn't mean we need to take each cut. So there's several harvest management uh, systems that are possible and that they can be tailored to the needs of each dairy farm. And as I think, I think as we go along, this is what we're going to find. It's different strokes for different folks. And some farmers are going to be cutting every cut at the bud stage. Other ones are gonna be looking at cutting every one at the early bloom, whereas many other farmers are going to vary their timing depending on the specific crop and what the needs are of the herd. And flexibility in the dairy business is always a good thing. 
So here are some questions that farmers are asking. And one of the first ones is, golly, it's reduced lignin. We know that lignin is what keeps plants growing erect. And so does reducing lignin content increase the lodging? Well, this is a fair question. I remember 25 years ago at Minor Institute, I was growing an alfalfa variety. It was very high quality. You looked at the forage analysis and it was remarkably high quality. Well, the reason was, while it was a good yielding variety, every cut lodged. And in a lot of cases, we were leaving a foot of stem in the field. And so we had a variety where we were getting higher quality, but yields were really challenging because it was lodging. Well, the good news with reduced lignin alfalfa varieties that are on the market now, so far, neither the research in the field or information from the seed companies or farmer experience is finding any problems with lodging with the reduced lignin alfalfa varieties. And that is great news. They apparently are standing up very, very well. The second question we ask is, you know, is, is reduced alfalfa quality or can it be too good? Well, it depends. If fiber digestibility is very high, we may need to make an adjustments in chop length and possibly in starch, in total NDF and in physically effective NDF. Uh, this is more likely if we're be, going to be harvesting bud stage at the bud stage, especially as we get into third cut or, or where we're harvesting bud stage, harvest, uh, harv extra alfalfa and feeding it with BMR corn silage. And again, I think the important thing here is not to knee jerk and, and make any dramatic changes in your feeding program just because you start using reduced lignin alfalfa. But as you do start using it, I think you need to consult closely with your dairy nutrition consultant to rely very closely on forage analysis because you may be seeing some numbers coming back on these forage samples that you're not used to. And so we, we may need to make some adjustments, but I think in a lot of cases, as long as we know what we have and what we're going to do with it, these changes can be, can be accommodated. And delaying harvest will mean bigger windrows. Alfalfa gains somewhere around 100, 150 pounds per acre of dry matter per day between the bud stage and 10% bloom. And, and that's the real, uh, the real enticement of having farmers wait until the reduced lignin alfalfa goes past the bud stage because you are gaining yield by day. Some uh, recent information from the University of Minnesota, they looked at reduced lignin alfalfa harvested at 35 days and at 30 day intervals. And at 35 days, they had 21% higher dry matter yields uh, than conventional alfalfa harvested at a 30-day interval. So that five days difference made a big difference in yield. But the thing to think about here is that you get a seven to 10-day delay in harvest, and you're going to be getting somewhere around a half ton more dry matter on the average or somewhere about a ton and a half more if you're looking at you know, fresh mode forage. So I really think that I, I prefer wide windrow management with all alfalfa hay crop silage systems. But I think when we're looking at the reduced lignin alfalfa management, the wide windrows are gonna be an absolute must. So I'm gonna turn this back to Mike now for our first poll question. Well, very good, Ev. Here's your first poll question, and uh, get ready to vote here. Uh, and Abby, you got to vote too. If you seeded reduced lignin alfalfa, would you harvest at the bud stage? And uh, Ev's done a nice job discussing some of these things. Uh, increase quality or delay harvest, go for increased yield. And there are three choices here. Choice one, harvest at the bud stage. Uh, second choice, uh, delay harvest until 10% bloom. Or the third one, it might vary by cutting. Boy, I've got mine picked out, Abby. What about you? <laughs> I feel like it would depend on your situation, right? Do you need more feed or you want that high quality feed? Um, you know, considering, you know, if I think about it and think probably having enough feed, I guess I'm going to go with the harvest at the bud stage and get that increased quality. What about oh. you, Mike? 
Well, I'm going to go by varied cutting because uh, growing up in Wisconsin and now in Illinois, that rain comes in and uh, they're pretty good at 24 hours. So I might be watching the weather and say, you know, I got this uh, wild card now. I can mm -hmm. maybe just wait, you know, another uh, another two or three days. And they're, I'm not sure about their long range prediction. We'll find out here on Tuesday how good their long range prediction is. But I, I guess I'm going to vote for the last one. But uh, we will see here, and we've got 70% uh, of the poll in, so uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead and share it, and uh, Ev, uh, what do you think of the polling results? Well, actually, I'm I'm a little surprised that as many people said it might vary by cutting as as they did. I'm, I'm kind of pleased at that because, you know, it shows that, that farmers are certainly willing to be flexible. Of course, if they weren't willing to be flexible, they wouldn't be farming for very long. Uh, it's interesting that harvesting at the bud stage and delaying harvest up until 10% bloom got just about 50-50 uh, on, on those two. In other words, uh, one versus the other. So uh, I'm not totally surprised, although that I, I guess I am a little surprised that the uh, we went uh, that high as uh, in the, the varied by cutting. But anyway, very good information. And uh, so let's move along. So let's talk about seeding grass with reduced lignin alfalfa. Now, if you're farming in the arid Southwest or you're irrigating alfalfa, this may not be an important question for you. But if you're farming in the Northeastern United States or in some of the North Central States or in the Eastern half of, of Canada, uh, there is a lot of alfalfa grown with a forage grass in these areas. Uh, in New York State, for instance, probably 80% of the alfalfa seeded each year is seeded with a forage grass. So it's a really operative question for those. And, so, and, and what we're looking at depends on whether we're using the conventional varieties of reduced lignin alfalfa or harv extra varieties. With the conventional varieties, uh, such as uh, with the, uh, with the, the hygest, there's, there's no issues really. And seeded as you would with conventional varieties, uh, however, you could not delay harvest past bud stage because while we have reduced lignin alfalfa, we don't have reduced lignin grass varieties. Uh, and the grass then would be too mature. I think the real advantage we have by using reduced lignin alfalfa with grass is because in a lot of cases, the grasses are maturing a little faster than we want to anyway. I've been telling farmers for years, if they're seeding alfalfa grass, that they should be choosing a grass species and perhaps variety within the species uh, that is as late as possible, because usually the maturity of the grass runs ahead of the maturity of the alfalfa. And so I think that uh, seeding grass with reduced lignin alfalfa gives us a really good option as long as we're gonna be harvesting in the bud stage. Now, with Harvester, that's different because all Harv Extra varieties are Roundup ready. Now, if you plant Harv Extra, don't use Roundup, then you can treat it the same as you would a conventional reduced lignin variety. But most people that are planting Harv Extra probably will use the Roundup. They've already paid for that trait, why not use it? But if they use alfalfa grass and then apply glyphosate, it's gonna kill the grass. Uh, so there is a limitation. However, I can tell you that some farmers have successfully established grass with harvest harv extra alfalfa by seeding the grass anywhere from a day to a week after the glyphosate was applied according to label directions. There's also some limited uh, data from Penn State where they did this on a small plot basis using orchard grass and by by applying the uh, the glyphosate and then by seeding the orchard grass uh, several days afterwards, uh, they were able to get very good establishment of the orchard grass. We do need considerably more research on this, but I'm cautiously optimistic that farmers will figure out a way uh, that if they really want to use grass and they really want to use Harv Extra alfalfa, uh, they'll figure out a way to get it done. The question is, you know, how many farmers are going to be willing to go in with that second seeding, in other words, the all grass seeding after the alfalfa is established. But I think time and a little bit more research will answer that question. But we, we do certainly have options in seeding grass with reduced lignin alfalfa. And I think for farmers that are already growing alfalfa and grass, reduced lignin alfalfa and grass is, is an ideal match. 
and especially if you use meadow fescue. There's considerable research being done at Cornell University now with meadow fescue. It's not a new species, uh, but it's one that has had uh, renewed interest uh, among farmers. And harvesting at the bud stage can result in excellent forage quality and in a lot of cases higher yield than with, cl than with clear alfalfa. And harvesting at the bud stage, it does not uh, result in a change in a farmer's schedule, assuming he already harvests at the bud stage. And, and I would say that uh, meadow fescue and uh, reduced lignin alfalfa is a really good option for fields with variable drainage, where we have a lot of good areas for alfalfa and some areas that are just a little bit on the moderate drainage rather than well-drained. Now, folks, reduced lignin alfalfa is new stuff. We need to be patient. We're still learning how to best use this exciting new technology. Research data so far is limited, um, but more research is on the way. And, and I think a year or two, we're gonna be a lot smarter than we are now because we're gonna have more research under our belt. And sure, reduced lignin alfalfa seed is more expensive than that of conventional varieties with the genetically uh, enhanced or genetically modified uh, Harvextra. Uh, considerably more expensive, but properly managed, the increased milk production from higher forage quality and possibly higher yield should more than compensate for any difference in seed cost. Seed cost, even with fairly expensive seed, is a, a rather small portion of the total investment in, in alfalfa production. And I think that uh, farmers certainly learned this as they looked at the uh, trait cost of Roundup Ready alfalfa. And I think they're going, to, they're going to also realize this as they look at the advantages of using reduced lignin alfalfa in dairy rations. So we're up to our second poll question. Mike? Yep, Bev, we're ready to go here on our second poll question. Uh, based on what you heard in this webinar so far, how likely are you to seed a reduced lignin alfalfa variety in 2019? And you have three choices again, highly likely, maybe, nah, not for me, not for me. It's interesting, uh, some of you were online listening earlier when uh, Ev and I and Abby were talking uh, at our dairy summit meetings we had this last year, I'd say a third of our dairy farmers uh, either already had it partially in the ground and gonna experiment with it. And so uh, I don't think Ev, they're going 100%. Maybe you wanna think about that a little bit as well, or maybe that'll come as a question, but uh, you know, uh, should we be, we told them they should experiment, they should give it a try. So we're off and running here. Abby, any comments on the Hordes Farm? Do you know if you have any of it in the ground? You know, Mike, that I am not sure about. I feel like, much like you said, the farmers that I've spoken to, it seems like some people are willing to give it a try um, and they're are kind of experimenting a little bit. So we will see what people in the audience here are doing and out of curiosity and see who's kind of ventured down that road so far. Well, let's go, Jim. Let's close the poll. We're close to 60%. It looks like our Democrats are slower today, but we will go from there. And, uh, Ev, what do you think of the uh, of the numbers? Oh, not terribly surprising. Uh, I 50% maybe. You know, a lot of farmers are not willing to commit to something without seeing a little bit more information. And, and you know, we still have to remember that this is new stuff. Uh, I'm, I guess, encouraged that we have something more than a third of the farmers saying it's going to be highly likely. Uh, we probably could have rephrased that question and say, you know, um, have you seeded it to be, or, and are you likely to seed it? We may have changed things, but uh, no, I think those certain numbers are certainly encouraging. I mean, what we're looking at is about 90% of the people on the panel are saying, well, either I'm going to do it or there's a chance I'm going to do it. And that's certainly good enough for me. Okay. Well, we have, uh, we've addressed uh, reduced lignin alfalfa and, and hopefully between uh, what we've discussed here and information that you've seen from other sources, you have a pretty good handle on where we're heading. But I didn't want to close this down without uh, talking a little bit about some other alfalfa variety topics uh, because there has been a, a lot of, of development in the alfalfa business over the past 20 or 30 years. It had nothing to do with, with the reduced lignin content. Uh, we have hybrid alfalfa that's been out for, oh, I guess, perhaps 20 years. Now, alfalfa hybrids, they don't always top the university alfalfa variety trials. And, and I follow a lot of them. 
but you know, they usually rank in the top half and in a lot of cases in the top third. And I said to farmers, you know, even if you have a variety or a type of alfalfa that doesn't always top the trials, isn't it pretty neat to know that with a pretty high reliability that that variety is going to be a better than average producer? Um, and, and that is where hybrid alfalfa has been. It, it's not always been tops, but, but seldom do you see it now near, near the bottom. The disadvantages, if you will, or at least it's not an advantage, is that there isn't any obvious difference in forage quality or in persistence or in uh, some of these other characteristics. Now, we do have some hybrid alfalfa that has an improved, uh, improved tolerance for limited drainage, but we also have that in some non-hybrid alfalfa varieties, so I wouldn't say that's unique to, to hybrid alfalfa. And then we have multi-leaf alfalfa. And that's an interesting, an interesting trait, I guess you could call it, because there's typically five leaflets uh, per leaf instead of the normal three. I've seen some that have seven. The early ones out, and I think the first variety was perhaps Legend, and I think we had when we planted that one at Minor Institute, they had a, had a relatively small percentage of multi-leaf expression. In other words, most of the plants in the field were trifoliate but there was a certain percentage uh, that were multifoliate or multi-leaf. Uh, now with all these different cycles of breeding, we have multi-leaf alfalfa varieties that have a very high multi-leaf expression. But we did some work on some of these varieties at Minor Institute, and we actually removed each leaflet from the stem and looked at the weight of the stem and the weight of the leaflets when everything was dried down. And we found out that there really wasn't much difference in the percent leaf to stem ratio, if you will, or the leaf to stem ratio between multi-leaf alfalfa and the trifoliate varieties. That there were more leaves on the multi-leaf varieties, but they tended to be smaller. And so there wasn't any appreciable difference in forage quality. And that's pretty much what we have seen from the university trials. The good, the good thing is there isn't any price premium and there's wide availability. Most forage, uh, most seed companies that are selling alfalfa have at least one multi-leaf alfalfa variety. And there really isn't any disadvantage. Uh, it, it's just, that it's one of the characteristics that farmers you know, they can choose a multi-leaf variety if they so choose, but don't expect superior quality just because it has the multi-leaf characteristic. Okay, then leaf-resistant alfalfa. And this, you could say, this would be a little bit of a controversial topic. Uh, most forage seed companies sell at least one leaf hopper resistant variety, and there's little or no price premium. They're about the same as a conventional variety. The... The problem is, is that leafhopper varieties have always had some yield drag versus the non-resistant varieties. And, uh, and limited research data suggests that they still do. Why do I say limited research? Because it is really difficult to find what I would say reliable information comparing the newest leafhopper-resistant hop alfalfa varieties and the newest conventional varieties. And that's because most seed companies, they simply do not enter their leafhopper varieties in the same trials that they enter their, the, the non-resistant varieties. In other words, the conventional varieties. And so mostly we're guessing about current yield drag. Uh, based on the, some of the work that was done at Cornell University a few years ago, where we were able to cajole a couple of seed companies into entering uh, their leafhop resistant varieties along with the top conventional varieties, we did see a, a modest yield drag with the, the leafhopper resistant varieties yielding not quite as well. But for me to sit here and say that there's a 5% or 10% or 12% difference, can't say so because we have what I would call a data drought. Uh, we just don't have a lot of information. It is my belief that leafhop resistance is Varieties still are lower yielding, but I, I whether it's plus or minus 10 percent is anybody's guess. So should you or shouldn't you? Uh, are leaf hoppers a problem on your farm? Usually a problem on your farm. Um, they're migratory. It seems like they're worse in some areas than they are in others. And if you're in an area where leaf hoppers are a problem, do you or a crops consultant regularly scout fields and then apply an insecticide if they're over threshold? If you do, fine. 
if you don't, in other words, if you have a leaf hopper problem and are honest enough to say, I'm not going to have chemicals applied, uh, then uh, perhaps a leaf hopper resistant variety is for you, even with a modest yield drag. And not all alfalfa technologies include leaf hopper resistant varieties. In other words, depending on what other traits you want in alfalfa, you may not be able to have the leaf hopper resistant trait so that you may need to make a choice in this regard. So why I like leaf hopper resistant alfalfa? We have benefited from both native and introduced parasites that are controlling alfalfa weevils and blotch leaf miners in many areas. And, and, and these farmers in a lot of cases don't need chemical control. I have to admit I'm biased here because I was around when alfalfa uh, weevil first came into the Northeast. I saw the damage it did. I was also around when the parasites were introduced and actually had the opportunity to do some spreading around these parasites myself. And I saw the wonderful job they did. Applying insecticides for control of leafhoppers also will kill the benef beneficial insects, including both the native and introduced ones. And unless there's no other option. I just don't think we should mess with Mother Nature unless it's absolutely essential to put a, to apply an insecticide to these alfalfa fields. I would much prefer to let the natural, both the native and the introduced parasites to do, to do their work. And with the development of genetic resistance, you know, you don't have to make decisions based on the damage thresholds. It's just, it's just an easier, easier to do. So our final poll question. Yes, yeah, final. This will be kind of fun one. I think uh be interesting. I'm not sure where it'll go. In the final poll question, and these are neat questions, would you plant a leaf hopper resistant alfalfa variety if you knew it had a 20% yield drag? And there are three interesting choices. Yes, if it meant I wouldn't have to spray. Second choice, no, I'd apply an insecticide if necessary. Or thirdly, no, and I wouldn't spray even I had a leaf hopper problem. So, Abby, we're off and running here. I know where I'm going to go, but I bet I'm going to lose on my bet here. I'm, I'm going to tip my hand first. I'm going to say, no, I'll only apply the insecticide if I need to. What's your going to vote? Where are you going to vote here, Abby? Mike, that was my selection, too. I think with a 20% yield, potential yield drag, I think I would just... I'd probably shy away from that variety and spray if needed. Yeah, and another problem we have, um, Hutchins is Dutch, and so we're pretty tight with the money. I'm not <laughs> sure. I, I think Bauer is German, but then again, that's your may, that's your married name, so I'm not sure if there's any <laughs> hereditary uh, bias coming in here as well. But it looks like we got enough votes in here, so Jim, let's share it with uh, Evan, uh, see what if he's going to be surprised again. No, what I'd say, what I'd say is, is there's 14% of the farmers that are either brutally honest or hard-headed, uh, saying that they, uh, they, they, uh, they don't want to plant a leaf hopper resistant, resistant variety, and they wouldn't spray even if they had a problem. But I'm not surprised at the other, uh, the other, the fact that there's about a 50/50 between uh, uh, if you uh, would uh, would use one if you wouldn't have to spray or uh, that you wouldn't use one and you'd rather spray. Uh, in other words, spray and you wouldn't have to do that every year and gain that 20% advantage. Again, again, I don't know that it's a 20% yield drag. Uh, there's been some trials that have seen something over 10% yield drag, but I use 20% to you know kind of make it easier for a farmer to decide on yes or no. Okay, well, that's, that's pretty much it for the, uh, for the questions. And just getting into the summary, um, first, that there's not a lot to get excited about regarding alfalfa quality until we got the advent of reduced lignin varieties, and this has made it a whole new ball game. And farmers now have options. They can use Harv Extra um, versus con uh, conventionally developed reduced lignin uh, high, high fiber digestibility varieties. Um, they can harvest at the bud stage or they can harvest at early bloom. And they can seed either with or without a forage grass. And it's, it's great to have options. We have options in varieties and variety types and in how we use these varieties. Again, there's going to be a steep learning curve. We're going to know a lot more about reduced lignin alfalfa and how we manage it in the next year or two. And multi-leaf alfalfa looks great in the field. There isn't any seed price premium, but yield and quality are, are, are similar to the 
trifoliate varieties. Hybrid alfalfa has really good, consistently good performance. Uh, it usually is up in the top half of the trials, rarely worse than that. Has similar seed price, but also similar forage quality to conventional varieties. And finally, leaf hop resistant alfalfa. It probably has a yield drag versus non-resistant varieties. It may always, for all we know, but there's a data drought. We just don't have as much information as we'd like to. And finally, it's an excellent choice where hopper burn is common and the farmer, for one reason or another, is not going to apply insecticide when and if it is needed. And with that, uh, I am done, I'm ready for questions. Okay, we'll turn it back to Abby to kind of give us our first one, a little summary here, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, first, to Ev for that great amount of information um, in a short presentation. As you mentioned, this is a new, a new area, new topic. We're still learning all the time, but I think it's important for producers and alfalfa growers to know what options are out there so they can make an informed decision. So thank you, Ev, for covering that topic for us today. We are also very appreciative of Harv Extra for sponsoring this session, and we definitely thank them for their participation today. Um, you can see their logo on the screen there, and feel free to look them up online to get more information about their company or their product. If you would like to view this webinar again, um, it's available at any time at our website, www.hordes.com slash webinars. You can find this webinar and all of our past webinars at that location. If you're listening to the webinar today, you'll also receive an email survey, and we would appreciate your feedback on that. And the information we gain from that survey helps us plan future webinars, selecting topics and speakers that would be appealing to you for future webinars. So please take a few moments to fill that out. It's greatly appreciated. We hope that you'll take time to join us next month for our upcoming webinar. That will take place on August 13th, um, the second Monday of the month. The topic of that presentation is the Jersey breed. Um, what's different about jerseys and what's not? That will be presented by Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. And we are happy to have a sponsor for that webinar. It is KTG North America, um, a specialty feed products company. And they are supporting us in that webinar. Looking forward two months from now in September on the 10th, we have the topic bolstering transition cow immunity presented by Marcus Kearley. And that presentation is sponsored by Diamond V. So please put these dates on the calendar if the topics are interesting to you. Um, we hope that you'll be able to join us. Mike, I know we have a few questions here for Ev. If you could go through those and kind of guide the Q&A session, I think we are at the time for that. Well, very good. Uh, Ev, a great timing on your webinar. We appreciate that. So we have time for questions. Here's the first one, Ev. Uh, do these reduced lignin alfalfa varieties affect optimal moisture in siling moisture levels, making hay, hay silage, for example, or maybe even baling it as baled hay? No, I would certainly say that as long as you're, you're dealing with a comparable yield uh, of the reduced lignin alfalfa versus a conventional alfalfa, which is what I would expect if you were going to be harvesting it at the bud stage, I would not just expect to see any difference in drying rate, drying time, moisture content on the stem, any of these things. However, as we are going to delayed harvest, in other words, letting it go to the early bloom stage because of the higher yield, you're going to see a, a lower rate of drying, especially if you don't change the width of the windrow. So in a situation like that, the drying time would be increased, but it would not be because of a difference in the variety, it would be because of the difference in the yield. Another question has to do with costs, and maybe uh, can you give us roughly, a, and I understand it will vary from country to country, what would be the typical cost for a traditional alfalfa versus the two lignin, lower lignin alfalfas we talked about here, and is there a difference in seeding rates, in other words, what a cost per acre or, or seed count or something like that? Well, first rates, the, the seeding rates, at least initially, have not changed between the conventional and the reduced lignin alfalfa. However, the Harvextra variety varieties, and again, this 
changes depending on the seed company uh, and also, you know, what kind of, of discounts a farmer early order, early pay, you know, you know, treat me nice because I'm poor, all those different kinds of discounts. Uh, but if you're probably looking at, at somewhere in the $600 or so range per unit, per 50 pound unit, uh, and because some farmers think that this is a high price, uh, there have been some suggestions that farmers could reduce the seeding rate from whatever they're using. And this would depend on what they're using. I, I personally think that with today's uh, good equipment and good field management, the recommendations of 18 pounds of seed per acre is more than we need. And I think in a lot of cases, we could reduce that seeding rate, but not because it's hard extra, but because farmers are just doing a better job of establishing alfalfa. But I think with the relatively high seed cost of the genetically in, in engineered variety of alfalfa, that is going to encourage farmers to look at a lower seed seeding rate. And I think in a lot of cases, they're going to be really surprised. Uh, I know in one case, uh, a farmer went in and made a big mistake and seeded the alfalfa at half the seeding rate he intended. And it turns out he got a gorgeous stand because everything else was right. He had a perfect seed bed. And he had put that seed right in the light, right location, and then he got good weather afterwards. We're looking at a moderate increase in price between the conventional alfalfa and and the uh, and and the high gest varieties. I don't know, probably a you know, maybe a ten or fifteen percent difference. But again, you have to understand that the price of conventional alfalfa seed, you know, ranges all over the map. But certainly the the uh, uh, the conventionally produced reduced lignin and alfalfa varieties are at a price premium, uh, whereas the Harv Extra, because farmers are having to pay the two trait costs, one for the the reduced lignin trait and the other for the uh, the Roundup Ready trait, uh, that is the reason why the seed cost is considerably more. But as I said before, uh, seed cost even at six hundred dollars per unit. If you take a look at the total cost of producing a ton of alfalfa, it's pretty modest. Okay, we have actually two questions, Ev, and you knew this one was coming. For farms implementing both BMR corn silage and low lignin alfalfa, how would you suggest strategies as far as balancing for high digestibility while maintaining adequate retention time? And the second question reflects that same approach, those two high quality forages in today's feeding program. Sure. And that information was uh, was, was presented uh, uh, by Randy Shaver, uh, I think it was, uh, some time ago in some work that they did uh, out at Wisconsin. Uh, and, and they had some you know, really, really good comments on that. And what they were saying is, if you're going to be reusing the, the Harv Extra variety of, uh, of reduced lignin and alfalfa and harvesting in the bud stage, and then feeding that along with BMR corn silage, then you just have to do a very, very precise job of ration balancing, taking a look, taking a look again at total NDF, at physically effective NDF, at available starch. Uh, in other words, just very closely addressing the ration. That's if it's harvested at the bud stage. If you harvest either the, the conventional reduced lignin alfalfa, harvested at the bud stage, or Harv Extra harvested at the 10% bloom stage, then the chances of having to make substantial ration adjustments are, are substantially less. And so there, there are several avenues, but I would certainly say that the combination of BMR corn silage, which of course is reduced lignin corn silage, we don't call it that, but that's what it is, reduced lignin corn silage and reduced lignin alfalfa harvested at the bud stage, uh, that's when we need to pay attention to some of these some of these ration parameters. We can certainly work around it, but we just have to know what we have and then what we're going to do with it. Well, here's two tough ones. Here's the first one. Does the research suggest low lignin alfalfa requires more irrigation or water, if you wish, for us folks here in the Midwest to achieve the yields represented in your presentation? Oh my goodness, that is a good question. I would say that if it's harvested in the bud stage, the answer would be no, because we would not be taking any more yield off at that at the bud stage. However, if we are going to be harvesting 
it at the 10% bloom stage in its uh, Harvextra variety, then we are going to be producing, you know, with Minnesota data suggests we could be producing another 20% of yield. And in a situation like that, it's not unreasonable to think that we may need some more, more irrigation uh, water. I, I don't think that there's any research data out there. Uh, I, I'm just making what I would consider a logical conclusion. But harvested the bud stage, I don't think there's going to be much difference at all. Harvested at 10% bloom, maybe. Well, get your thinking cap and crystal ball out here. Do you know if there is an increase in the number of farmers that have seeded Harv Extra or the lower lignin alfalfa this year compared to last year here in the United States? Any feel on application or adaptation of this technology? I have seen no data at all. My guess would be that there will be a substantial increase in the use of reduced lignin alfalfa, both Harv Extra and the conventionally produced or conventionally bred varieties in the next year or so. Uh, number one, because there's been some very promising yield results on it. And number two, just because there's so much more information out there that farmers are much more aware of this than they have been in the past, uh, uh, you know, through we webinars, through websites, through uh, promotional um, programs by the various seed companies, uh, certainly farmer awareness is increased. And I would be very surprised if we do not see a, a at least a moderate increase in the acreage of the various reduced lignin alfalfa sold, uh, marketed or planted in the U.S. U.S. and in Eastern Canada. Well, I have here this this question came in quite early. You may just want to recap. And his question was, how is it possible to achieve more product with three versus four cuttings? And uh, I think you've highlighted that. You may just want to summarize why you'd be able to get more yield with a, a three cutting system versus a four cutting system using this technology? Yes, two, two reasons. N number one, you have a big increase in yield as alfalfa goes from the bud stage to 10% bloom. The Minnesota data showed over 20% increase in yield in, in that period of time. Secondly, if you are reducing the, uh, the or increasing your harvest interval, in other words, where you're going, uh, a 10% bloom versus bud stage, that alfalfa has had the opportunity to accumulate considerably more root reserves. And it's those root reserves that are responsible for producing the next crop. And so it's just like, uh, it's just like feeding a cow more, for, more feed, in other words, having more stored nutrients in that alfalfa's uh, taproot. So there's two reasons. N number one is going to simply because the delay in harvest increases yield. The second thing is that that plant is going to be nutritionally stronger and able to really push yield very hard right after cutting because it has more reserves. Ev, you also mentioned in your presentation the meadow fescue. Uh, over here, we hear the, tall, the word called the word tall fescue. Is that the same crap? Is that is that the same thing? And what about endophyte? Is there any risk with endophyte in fescues? The, the the tall fescues that are being marketed for marketed now by the seed companies uh, are, are basically endophyte free. So I would not worry about that as long as you're using one of the good varieties you're being sold by by the forage seed companies. They're well aware of this. There are many fescues that are out there that you're not going to have to worry about that. And if you plant a tall fescue, it will remain endophyte free. There's no such thing as fescue catching endophytes. That, that will not happen. But no, meadow fescue and tall fescue are entirely different. Uh, and the results that we have seen in the Northeast is that seeded in pure stands, tall fescue will outyield meadow fescue. But very curiously, when you seed meadow fescue in a stand with alfalfa, it will actually yield more than tall fescue. Uh, I would say my first and second choices for forage grasses seeded with alfalfa would be first meadow fescue and second tall fescue. Both are fine. The advantage that meadow fescue has is that it has substantially higher fiber digestibility uh, at so a variety of maturities compared to tall fescue or reed canary grass or timothy or orchard grass or you know any of the other forage grasses. So I really like meadow fescue, and it is it is different than tall fescue. 
And here's your last question, and kind of interesting. What new exciting thing is coming down the, the track for legumes or alfalfas after this one? Is there something really exciting that you're aware of as a plant breeder and works in the crops area for legumes and grass, for legumes rather? I think the real biggie has already is already happening in the reduced lignin level. I think we may start looking at perhaps differences in pectin levels uh, as we go along. But again, that's for the plant physiologist more than anything else. Uh, I We've already had some progress in terms of low crowns so that they are more resistant to crown damage. So that's not a new thing. I think as we go in and possibly combine some of the, the low crown levels uh, with the uh, with the uh, reduced lignin alfalfa, and maybe we can build on this. But but I really think that the most exciting thing in the alfalfa breeding business in the past 50 years is happening right now, and that's reduced lignin alfalfa. Well, very good. Uh, sounds great, Ev. We're going to turn the program back to Abby to wind up here. Lots of great discussion and points in your questions. And Abby, why don't you finish up the webinar for us, please? Thank you, Mike. Great questions from the audience. And Abby, as Mike said, did a wonderful job recapping the presentation and answering those questions. Once more, we'd like to thank Harv Extra for partnering with us and sponsoring this webinar. Um, their support is greatly appreciated by us. And again, if you want to learn more, feel free to look them up online. We also would like to thank Ev for taking the time to join us from um, his location in New York to be a part of this webinar. The future webinars topics are listed on the screen. Again, in August, we'll be talking about the Jersey cattle breed and how they compare to Holsteins and the other breeds. And then in September, we'll be touching on transition cow immunity. So please um, put these dates on the calendar and make plans to join us now in the upcoming months. Lastly, I'd like to thank all of you on the audience for listening in today. We really appreciate the time you take to further um, educate yourselves in the different topic areas. And um, we're always glad to have a good audience with us during each of these webinars. For now, I'd like to say goodbye from all of us here at Horde Steerman and the Uver University of Illinois. Again, we hope that you'll make plans to join us for one of our future webinars. So take care, everybody.